Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Baker Institute. I'm very happy to have you here tonight. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, in the midst of the current economic crisis and the immense international challenges, there may not be a more timely and thought-provoking uh, narrative on the future of world politics than Paul Starobin's book, After America. One need not agree with all of our speaker's conclusions to admire the scope of his knowledge or the depth of his analysis, and accordingly, I strongly encourage you to read After America. I told Paul that I had downloaded it on my Kindle, uh, which is one of the new modes. The financial crisis which spread from the United States first to Western Europe and then elsewhere has raised profound questions both about Washington's economic leadership and what could be called the American laissez-faire free market model. We have seen last month the coordinated approach, the G20, adopted at their meeting in Pittsburgh on the regulation of financial institutions, complex financial instruments, and executive compensation. They even agreed to a system of peer review of each other's economic policies, which some may see as intrusion of academia into world politics and a diminution of sovereign decision making. And as you know, the G20 is now the new G8, and it's become the focal point of uh, coordinated uh, global issues. Nevertheless, President Obama posited that his administration, and I'm quoting here, has renewed American leadership and pursued a new era of engagement, unquote, that has produced tangible results, including what he said, an historic agreement to reform the global finance, financial system. Now, is President Obama right? in reasserting this claim to American leadership, or is the trend line going in the other direction? History remains the complex, ambig ambiguous thing it has always been, as we all know, a phenomenon that George Kennan once, once famously described as, quote, one damn thing after another. <laughs> and believe me, when you've been in government, it is one damn thing after another, despite all your great strategic concepts and plans that you put in place, you just realize that events often drive a strategy and policy. Our speaker is an expert in analyzing key trends from the welter of confusing events and conflicting evidence. He is well informed, provocative, and always willing to think outside the box of received opinion. He's precisely the sort of individual for whom the Baker Institute is proud to offer a platform to share his views. An accomplished journalist, who has written for many of the top national newspapers in the United States. He's reported from Russia, India, Central Asia, the Caucasus, the Middle East, Europe, and South America. In Moscow, he served as Bureau Chief of Business Week from 1999 to 2003. Today, he is a staff correspondent for the National Journal and a contributing ed editor to the Atlantic Monthly. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming back Paul Starobin to the Baker Institute. Paul. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ambassador, and uh, thank you also, Francois, for having me here. It uh, is indeed a return uh, engagement to the Baker School. I was here some years ago after doing my uh, stint in, in, in Moscow to talk about Russia. And so, um, in a way, that was a, that's a good place to start, because I don't know that I would have written this book had I not uh, done that, that tour in um, Moscow. There's something about being outside one's own home country, one's native country, that I think uh, inevitably, if unpredictably, gets one to thinking about uh, you know where things are in the world. You just have a certain distance, if, if not a detachment, that that makes such thoughts um, uh, you know come to you. And I, I think had I stayed in in Washington, where I'd been for much of my career, I probably wouldn't have, in fact, uh, written the book. Um, it's also um, you know just to say a little bit about myself. It's a generational thing as well. I mean, I'm a child of the American century. I was born in 1957 on an Air Force base in Bangor, Maine, where the Strategic Air Command uh, was based. My dad was a physician working at the hospital. I grew up thinking I had a passport to see the, the world uh, with an American uh, passport. I could go anywhere, and I did. I remember sleeping on the 
beach on the shore of the Red Sea amidst the Bedouin tents in the, in the early 1980s, just before Israel gave back the Sinai to the uh, Egyptians uh, unharmed. And, you know, at that young age, I probably thought that no harm could indeed come to me. So it's a different world now, um, I think, for uh, Americans and for the American uh, traveler. Um, it's a world in which I now see that not everything uh, revolves around the American sun, the moon, and the, and the stars. Um, the global cosmos has become a little bit more uh, complicated than that. Um, so really, there are three core messages uh, uh, to the book. The, the first message, a kind of bracing one, I suppose, is that America has reached the end of a global political cultural and uh, economic ascendancy. Uh, this term, the American century, which was, uh, I guess, originally coined by Henry Luce, the founder of Time and Life in 1941, to define a period of American dominance in the world, is, um, is over. I believe it's over. Um, you know, it's important to remember this was not just some kind of a, a conceit and a newsman's uh, uh, Pitch, but it was a vision. It was a it was a it was a perspective on the world that was widely shared by people at the time, not just political and and, and business leaders, but but cultural uh, figures. Uh, Clement Greenberg, who was the art critic for Partisan Review back then, believed that uh, had been with with Europe's demise, with its self destruction, really in the in its you know civil wars of the first part of the 20th century, that America had achieved a kind of unique conjunction of of, of cultural, political, and economic dominance that would be very long lasting. Uh, when the Swiss-born photographer Robert Frank applied to the Guggenheim Foundation in the mid-50s for his tour, uh, for a grant to tour the country taking snapshots, uh, he said he wanted to. He said, uh, "I'm a naturalized American, and I'd like to see the United States. What kind of what signifies a kind of civil, civilization born here and, and spreading elsewhere, spreading elsewhere?" And I think that's sort of the the, the thing to keep in mind. Um, I don't think we're quite at that that spread anymore. I think that um, that's what I mean in a sense by the by the end or by the ebbing. And in certain respects, we've become uh, a middling, a global laggard in terms of basic standards of of modernity. And this is an argument that distinguishes the book from uh, another that has um, gotten some attention, uh, Fareed uh, Zakaria's uh, The Post-American World, which is all about the rise of the rest, the Chinas, the, the Indias uh, of the world. Uh, I think the rise of the rest is, is right, but there's another side of the coin, and, it's, and that is this, this sense of an underperforming uh, America. I think both things are, are true, and, and we shouldn't um, de-emphasize the, the latter because it might feel you know, good or reassuring, you know, not, not to talk about it. Uh, you know, the global economic crisis is the event that has everyone's uh, attention now, but I began working the book really before it, it, it started, and I didn't comp really particularly have that in, in mind. I think of the crisis as, as an exhibit now of the defects of the American model in terms of our failure to modernize our financial regulatory system. I mean, that's for sure. We've had a, a system that's essentially been unchanged since the 19. 30s, but I think it reflects a deeper, you know, more entrenched uh, set of trends, you know, trends that I expect to endure uh, in some form, at least, even after the business uh, cycle kicks in as it's beginning to and the American economy starts to grow again. Uh, really what I'm talking about is what it means to be, you know, modern in the 21st century. Um, and not to get too much into sort of the definitional weeds. I mean, modern for me is another word for progress. And we can talk about what progress is, but that's the way I, I, I think of it. Um, I think at one point in our um, nation's life, there was no question that America was that vital force for progress and for modernity. Uh, you know, Mark Twain, um, always a pleasure for a writer to invoke uh, love to travel to, uh, to Europe in the late 19th century because he wanted to make sport of a society that compared to America was living in, in slow motion. Uh, he wrote, in all these years, the American fountain pen has hardly gotten a start in Europe. Uh, there, there is no market for it. It's too handy. It's too inspiring. It's too capable. It's too much of a time saver. And then there is the elevator, which America uh, invented, and which uh, he could not find any great examples of in Europe either. Uh, considering the age that he lived in, I think he would have found it inconceivable that the day would come when the Americans would be slower in certain respects than the Europeans, as well as other peoples, to take advantages of these uh, invaluable contrivances of the modern world, as he called them. For example, speed these days has to do with the pace and quality of uh, digital connections, and America is very far behind 
the pack. Uh, one standard measurement of this is, is how much time it takes to download data from the internet to a personal computer device. Uh, Japan leads the, the world with a median download speed of 64 megabits per second, and the ranks go down there from there, from South Korea at 50, Finland at 22, Sweden at 17, Portugal at 8, and then comes America, the world's 15th fastest country at 5 um, megabytes per <coughs> second. Uh, the average user in Japan can download iTunes movies in about two minutes. For the American user, nearly half an hour uh, is needed. And it's not just a question of enjoying you know, our entertainments. I mean, digital speed is a really basic uh, ingredient for product innovation. Uh, another another indicator of this might be in income uh, inequality. I think America, from the Jacksonian period of the early uh, 19th century onward, was was one of its its cardinal uh, one of its signatures as a society was was uh, a kind of equal opportunity for all and an ability for everyone to kind of have a shot at it at, at going climbing up the economic ladder. America was able to avoid, for the most part, the kind of class divisions that have uh, encrusted Europe and, and, and Russia and many other societies, South America, for so many decades. Um, but our pace-setting role as a kind of egalitarian society began to come to an end in the mid-1970s. Uh, since that time, income inequality has been widening for a number of reasons, not least uh, the failure of America to supply all of its citizens with the first-class uh, uh, primary education. Uh, a study by the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of Boston found that since the uh, 1970s, U.S. families have been significantly less likely to move up the income ladder, prompting questions that go to the heart of our identity as a nation. Uh, a study by the Pew Charitable Trust a few years ago found that economic mobility was actually higher <clears throat> in Denmark, Canada, and Finland in America, and by some measurements, uh, higher in the United Kingdom and maybe even in Germany. Healthcare. Well, you know, where our, our uh, media is 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 full, uh, saturated. One would say now with the discussion of the healthcare reforms, and underlying that discussion, I think, is a widespread sense, which is backed up by an enormous amount of statistical uh, evidence, that America is not the leading uh, provider of healthcare services uh, in in the world because it does not it does not have the world's healthiest. People, as a matter of life expectancy, um, it is below the average for the OECD, you know, countries of, of rich nations in North America, Europe, and also Japan. Uh, it has the highest rate of infant mortality in the industrialized world. A lot of this comes down to a poor quality of preventive care. In Manhattan, there are two and a half times as many hospital admissions for avoidable uh, <clears throat> hospital conditions as there are in Paris. Um, and, uh, you know, we talk about the demographic uh, problem of Europe aging more rapidly than America. That's true. But the flip side of that is if you have healthier Europeans working longer uh, in later years of their life, they may be able to work more productively than Americans. Uh, energy and the Green Society. I mean, uh, part certainly part of what it means to be modern today is, is to go green. Uh, and uh, that's been true for at least the first oil shocks of the 1970s. But since that time... Um, America has been all too much uh, talk and very little action. Denmark, for example, was able to double the size of its uh, economy without increasing its uh, total energy consumption. Um, you know, I was leafing through the current issue of The New Yorker, which has a cartoon, uh, husband and wife in the car on the highway, uh, two rowing oars sticking out of the windows, one for her, one for him. And he says, well, you know, honey, I just don't know when the Americans are going to be able to make a decent hybrid car. So we laugh, but we want to cry in some sense. I mean, this is not a new story. This is not a new story. Detroit's uh, problems are a story that go back at least uh, four decades. Uh, innovation in manufacturing, I mean, there's a, you know, the Boston Consulting Group and the National Association of Manufacturers did a survey back in March, which had Singapore leading the way, followed by South Korea. Uh, according to the uh, business executives interviewed for the survey, the United States lacks uniqueness. Innovation is now found everywhere, not exclusively or even prominently in the United States. Um, and it's like sports. So athletes get old and new players step up to the plate. So I think you know what this adds up to is that although America is tremendously um, innovative in, in science and in, in medical research and a whole number of research fields, it, for, there seems to be a missing gear, you know, kind of connecting the in, uh, the invention to its use in the wider uh, society, um, and that is part of what indicts the American 
model for social betterment and economic betterment because you know we were never just about creating marvels. Uh, we were about using them. We were about taking the best that a democratic society uh, can can produce and making the benefits available to everyone. Um, and we did that, for example, in creating the motor, motor car society at the beginning of the 20th century when that was what represented uh, progress. So what's next? I mean, something has to be next if 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 um, something is is ending or or, or ebbing. Um, you know, I'm used to be calling a, a, being called a, a declinist, uh, which I guess is okay, but I prefer the term endist uh, in the sense that, uh, as T. S. Eliot said, every end is is also a, a beginning. Uh, and uh, others uh, who don't want to talk about the decline might be called denialists. That's a term that uh, one of my uh, interlocutors uh, has suggested uh, to me. So the question of what comes next after the American era has yet to be uh, decided. I think this is a time of interregnum. There are multiple uh, narratives, uh, multiple future possibilities. I mean, the world can be pregnant with more than one of these possibilities at the same time. I think a lot of this is a question of uh, circumstance and and choice. As, As the ambassador said, events are often what drive things, not grand strategies, however carefully crafted. Uh, I have a view of history, which informs uh, the book as a kind of organic and bottom-up uh, process. Um, I love to read the histories of the great men who formed the world, but I think the truth is better uh, put in the books of an historian like Brodell, for example, who writes about how change uh, often takes place at a, at, a, at a kind of tectonic pace and at a very deep level that often we are uh, very late to de- discern. Uh, but you know, if we had to kind of divide this this up, and we have to talk about these different futures, um, I can think broadly of of five. One is a very dark kind of a chaos. I mean, this would be the bleakest scenario. It's not one that I necessarily expect to happen, but you have to consider it. It's often what happens when we have a kind of uh, imperium or or an empire that has dominated the the world, and it begins to ebb. I mean, Rome is an example, of course, um, and we saw what happened there. And it took really centuries after the fall of Rome for any new kind of world order to uh, assert itself. Uh, you know, you could draw an analogy, I suppose, now with things that are happening in places like the Pakistan and Afghanistan tribal uh, borderlands. That would be a, a kind of marginal area that could become a kind of widening zone of, of chaos. I think you could say perhaps less obviously the same about Turkey, not that I expect it to collapse, but if you're looking at places where the fault lines are and the kind of the sense that Samuelton Huntington talked about in terms of a clash of civilizations, I visited central Anatolia in Turkey, which for millennia has been this kind of east and west uh, bridge place. And, you know, some of the things I found there were very um, uh, awkward and uncomfortable. I mean, uh, a lot of anti American, anti Israeli, anti Semitic rhetoric, a lot of kind of naive uh, propagandizing about the uh, the star in the east in, in Iran and what it might represent uh, for Turkish society. Uh, you know, at a very kind of vulgar nationalistic uh, rally, my guide was all concerned about me. You know, take off your glasses. You look like a CIA agent. I mean, it seemed like uh, this was not. You know, Istanbul is a completely different place. I was I was somewhere else, and it felt to me, at least, you know, an, impression, an impressionistic kind of a way that, that, that this could go in different directions. Um, you know, so if chaos happens, well, uh, some people, most people, of course, are going to be losers, and then there will probably be, as there always are in these these scenarios, some winners, the uh, the short sellers, the, the the ones who always profit when prices plummet. Uh, there'll be corpses to pick clean. There's a, already a growing number of people who have stockpiled their supplies of canned food, bottled water, and antibiotics, and dug their shelters, and you know they probably expect this world to happen in, in some way. Uh, you know, we can flip this around as well. I'm kind of play with the idea of a happy chaos. Uh, you know, the sense that finally we've reached a level of technological development that is empowering us, you know, personally with the Google kind of version of the planet. We can make our own connection. We don't need any big daddies, America or anyone else, to tell us what to do. The state can kind of, you know, uh, uh, float away. And, um, you know, this will be kind of a happy period because we've reached a new level. Of, of maturity. It's the kind of thing that was imagined many years ago by uh, the philosopher Immanuel Kant. I mean, for him, enlightenment meant literally the kind of casting off of paternal yokes because there's no longer any need for them. Um, 
you know, I'm not a big believer in it, although I, you know, part of me would like to see, the libertarian in me would like to see it, it, it happen. Um, you know, I tend to think that some disposition either towards evil in, in theological terms or towards power in more secular terms tends often to be pretty difficult to eradicate in humankind. But, um, you know, it's something that people might, might want to think about. I mean, there at least have been these kind of interludes of, of, of happy chaos in you know, places like Dada, Zurich, and Berlin after the First World War, or Grateful Dead, California in the 1960s. And so uh, if we have a certain kind of philosophical disposition or preparedness, then perhaps something like that could take root. Uh, you know, more conventionally, I think this discussion, at least in Washington, often boils around the idea of a multipolar world of nation states. Uh, you know, this is sort of, sort of the 21st century version of the 19th century, of a of rough balance or not achieved between uh, the established powers like, like, like America uh, and, I suppose, uh, uh, Russia, although it's not <coughs> nearly what it once was, and then the rising powers, you know, the Indias, the Chinas, perhaps a, a Brazil. Uh, in this world, the nation state, you know, even though it is a kind of battered entity, entity remains in, intact. Uh, all of the, the traditional coins of the geopolitical realm of, you know, hard power and brinksmanship, uh, you know, nationalism informing these societies, all of these things will be uh, in play. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see how it, 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 it happens. I think Russia uh, probably in the short term is going to determine whether this world uh, this multipolar world will take place. There's a lot of desire in uh, in the Kremlin, I think, to have this kind of a world. They have a sort of fond nostalgia for it, you know, dating back uh, through to, to, their, to the days of the white um, Russian Empire, which was such a big player in European uh, affairs. Uh, they've shown a willingness to shed some blood, um, as we saw in their, uh, their rather brutal military invasion of the former Soviet Republic of Georgia. Uh, they are very happy that they that President Obama has uh, shelved the plan which they so much opposed to build a missile defense system in Poland and the Czech Republic. A lot of this is a matter of will, of national will, and I think the Russians still still have it. Probably in the longer term, a better test case is India, which is seeking to become more of a traditional European-style national power. Um, I visited uh, a uh, naval base in, in Karwar on the Arabian uh, sea coast in India, which is supposed to be the biggest naval base uh, east of Suez in the entire world. And, and impressive, uh, you know, uh, they've got these enclosures uh, carved out of the rock for the submarines, and they, you know, they're, they're going to be building a, a, a naval av aviation uh, airstrip as well, all sorts of stuff. I mean, the problem is that India does these things incredibly slowly. Uh, you know, they've been building the base for at least... Uh, Two decades are tremendous inefficiencies. I mean, they're, you know, it's taken decades just to get people to move off the land and compensating them and all of those things. And so, you know, I don't know whether that, you know, that kind of multipolar world is going to exist is going to depend on the Indias of the world. And I'm not sure that they're going to quite get there. Um, so if it happens, if it happens, the biggest winners will be those states that can succeed in establishing regional hegemonies in their neighborhoods. Uh, you know that might so that might be United States and North America, perhaps Brazil and South America, India and China and in Asia, uh, Russia in its in near abroad, possibly Iran, which I think has a lot of multipolar potential, possibly in an alliance with China, which seems determined uh, to have a relationship with with Iran uh, of, of 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 a nature that uh, the Europeans and the Americans are not going to like. Uh, you know, there might be some interesting new alliances. Russia and Turkey could be another, you know, who have been so, sort of ancient uh, enemies in many in many cases might become allies in this kind of a world. Um, this will be a defeat for those who champion uh, liberal Western values as a kind of universal standard. Uh, the multipolar world will be peaceful to the degree that the big players can arrive at satisfactory terms for coexistence. Uh, a fourth future, uh, also I think familiar to, to many of you, is the Chinese century, where uh, China essentially replaces America as the new uh, imperium, uh, the new hegemon of, of the world. Uh, you know, the case for the Chinese century is often made on, on really, rather brute economic terms, that the, that the country that's destined to become the world's uh, larger producer of economic product, as China probably will at some point, if only by virtue of its, its numbers and its still impressive rate of growth, uh, that 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 player has to be essentially the dominant player, the one that calls the shots. I mean, I don't think it's that simple. If if we look at the example of the American uh, uh, hegemony and how it came to be, 
Uh, yeah, we became the world's number one uh, economy at the end of the uh, 19th century. But I think the most important thing was that we had a great story that we told the world, a very attractive story. I mean, that's what the model was about. I mean, people wanted to emulate us. Uh, you know, Max Lerner, the writer back in the 1950s, said this marvelous phrase, uh, the imperialism of attraction. You know, there was a kind of a tropism that was there now. And so the question in my mind is whether the Chinese or anyone else can have that kind of tropic power. Uh, at this point, I don't think that they do. I think that the world has, has yet to really make up its, up its mind about what they think of the of the Chinese and the Chinese engagement uh, with uh, so many different continents. Uh, I visited Chile, which has uh, the world's number one trove of copper, which is what interests the Chinese there. And, uh, you know, my feeling is in, in, in places like that, China's actually not as heavy-handed as, as it's often made out to be, uh, as it certainly has, uh, its reputation has been established in that, in that way in Africa. But at the same time, uh, you know, the Chileans were once uh, under the thumb, uh, more or less, of the, of the Americans, and they're not really looking forward to the opportunity to experience the same under the Chinese. So I think this is going to take a long time to, to, to play out. Uh, but, but I wouldn't just discount the Chinese engagement in places like, like South America. Uh, you know, as one American diplomat told me, don't be surprised to see Chinese naval vessels one day showing up in Chilean ports. Uh, well, China, of course, wins in a Chinese uh, century. Uh, losers, perhaps, will be those who've had tense relations with the Chinese over the years, like the Japanese and the and the Vietnamese. Uh, you know, for for more distant uh, players or partners, um, they, they, they might the Chinese century might not, in fact, be as bad or as bad as as, as many uh, fear. I mean, if they operate in a kind of laissez-faire. Uh, you know, sense in terms of their, you know, it depends on how they really, you know, are they disposed to be benign or or, or cruel uh, rulers. I just don't think the question's been decided. Uh, so going more outside of the the box, I, I one of my futures is what I call global city states, and this would be a kind of planetary wide version of the Italianate city states of the renaissance and would represent a kind of return to a smaller scale in, in political life. So the idea here is that the small and the modern are in a sense you know, linked uh, together now. It's really the big, whether it was the old USSR, whether it's the American you know, enormous uh, hegemon, whether it's anything that's, that's that big, this is not good news for China either, that is really the enemy of, of progress and that um, uh, things are going to now coalesce around a smaller scale. Uh, it's something actually that George Kennan, who was one of the great stewards of the American century, came to believe towards the end of his life. He suggested that America had become a quote-unquote monster country and might work better if it were decentralized into something like 10 republics uh, absorbing much of the powers of the federal establishment. Uh, his friends, I think, gave him a lot of guff about that, but he, he believed it. I mean, he wrote many letters. He was writing letters at the end of his life to the Vermont uh, separatists uh, who who shared them with me. Uh, you know, I visited a number of places, including uh, Berlin, Bangalore, Dubai, as a kind of test case for whether this can, can work. Uh, Dubai, for example, I found more interesting than I expected to. It's not just a playground for the wealthy folks and for uh, you know Al Qaeda to have its its biannual conventions and for the Russians to launder their money. Uh, you know, Harvard Medical School, for example, is building a state of the art uh, health treatment. Uh, uh, center there, and the idea is to make Dubai the number one healthcare uh, place in the Arab world and the Middle East generally. Um, and I'm sure, as I don't need to remind you, we're seeing a competition between Dubai and Houston for leadership in global energy services. Uh, not so long ago, Halliburton decided to shift its corporate headquarters from Houston uh, to Dubai to get closer to rising energy markets in, in Asia. Uh, an age of global city-states, you know, it offers a chance for Europe, which I think really has kind of lost a sense of national will or nationalism, to matter again, because European cities are very vital. I mean, not just London and Frankfurt and Paris, but, uh, you know, all kinds of places, Barcelona, Vienna, uh, places with a lot of cultural uh, appeal. I think North Americans, South Americans, Asians are not dealt out of this world, whether it's Hong Kong, Singapore, maybe a Santiago or a Sao Paulo. Uh, tremendous opportunities for global elites, architects, artists, business executives, university presidents, uh, all sorts of people. I, you know, I might enjoy living in, the, in this world. I'm not. I'm not sure, but it's. It's. Uh, I, I, I could imagine that. I think the multilingual person uh, stands to do much better than the monolingual one. And really, woe to those in the provinces and the margins of things, and, and un, unable to think in this kind of globally cosmopolitan way. 
Uh, the last scenario is a universal civilization leading to uh, global governance, which is uh, Dante's dream and, and many other poets' uh, dream, uh, Tennyson included. But, uh, you know, I think if it evolves, it's, it's not really at the dream level. It's more of a prosaic, you know, creepy crawl, a kind of organic uh, process. And, and going farther, I think, than many people might realize. I mean, if the world is, going, is, is one market, uh, then maybe there needs to be one system of financial uh, regulation. Um, as the ambassador mentioned, we now have a G8 that's becoming a G20, and a lot of that is about the fact that, that there, there are many voices out there, particularly in Europe and, and in other countries other than America, who, who want this more globally coordinated approach. Um, you know, maybe the global cli climate uh, crisis uh, gets us there. Greenhouse gases are by definition uh, promiscuous in their tendency to float all around the world. Uh, perhaps the cause of global human rights and international uh, justice. Uh, you know, we, we might not take too seriously uh, the UN on human rights and the International uh, Criminal Court at The Hague, but, you know, the Israelis certainly do. When a, uh, a former Hague prosecutor uh, <clears throat> not long ago found them guilty in investigation of, of disproportionate force in their action in Gaza, they took it very seriously. I mean, there's a court of public opinion that is now out there, which is global and which has a certain... Uh, power that I think was, was very much lacking in, in earlier times, and it, it will probably grow. Uh, you know, uh, Amer it's fashionable to say that America is, is, is so, so uh, jealous of its, its sovereignty and its independence that it's not going to participate in that kind of a world. I think that's kind of a myth. I think Americans and American institutions are already participants. Uh, uh, Americans educational institutions, Harvard. Harvard is now a global uh, educational institution. It's it, it's a prop for an emerging global society. It has migrated away from a national identity. This is not because you know the anti-American left has taken over Harvard. Uh, a leader in this migration is the Harvard uh, Business School, which now treats the planet as one big case study. Uh, at the Harvard Business View, a flagship uh, publication, uh, writers are no longer allowed to use American baseball metaphors because foreign readers may not understand them and because Harvard wants to talk in a global vocabulary. Uh, Hollywood, Hollywood, which was a real prop of the American uh, cultural hegemony, the Frank Capra films, all of it, uh, it, it doesn't view itself that, that way anymore. It wants to manufacture uh, global dreams uh, in a culturally diverse, uh, you know, multicultural marketplace. I spoke with the head of uh, Sony Pictures at his lot in Culver City, and he talked about how more of the revenues were coming from the global marketplace, how the big tentpole movies, as he called them, like the James Bond movies, had to be tailored for global appeal. The love interests had to come all from different countries and this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, the idea of Hollywood being this expression of, of unique American values, uh, this idea, he said, this is over, he said. This is not what Hollywood does anymore. Um, so if we have that kind of a universal civilization taking root, I think the winners are certainly going to be the kind of super class uh, that we talked about who might, you know, for example, be prominent in the, in the global city-states. Um, the global bureaucracy will be a winner. Uh, which is what concerns me, that people will be more at the mercy of global political and economic uh, institutions. If the model uh, for this is the European Union, which it might be, uh, you know, a lot of people are going to be unhappy with that because, you know, there are many mixed feelings about how well the EU uh, works. So the last message here, really, the final takeaway is that it, whatever shape the after America world takes, it pays for us, you know, for, for, for we Americans really to think long and hard about it, to be philosophically prepared for change on a large scale. Uh, you know, we want to avoid nostalgia, which I think is a kind of uh, trap here and even a kind of, of poison if, if it results in our doing, you know, dangerous things to ourselves and to the world. As You know, the British, for example, in their misstep in the, in the 1950s in, in Suez, I think, was all about a, a kind of foolish uh, nostalgia. I mean, there's poignancy here. I think the reason behind some of the denial that we see in Washington about these trends is that they don't want to talk about it. I was at a event not long ago with Les Gell, the uh, former um, chairman of the Council on Foreign Relations, and, and he, 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 you know, he, we were asking him about these kinds of trends, and he said, you know, I'm just not going to really go there. I mean, he, he grew up, at, you know, it's, it's, I think it's partly a generational thing, and I think it's, I think it's very difficult. I think, I think people um, have, in some sense, a kind of reflexive tendency to, to look away, but we don't want to look away. We don't want to wait for the political class in, in Washington to wake up to these things because they're going to be late to this game. 
Uh, we can do things on our own. I mean, becoming more globally aware. We can have our children learn farm and languages at the earliest possible age. Uh, you know, I used to live in Northern Virginia, where there's this wonderful school, uh, Kent Gardens Elementary School in McLean, which is a French language uh, immersion school for every student that attends. Every door, every sign, all in French. Uh, you know, these schools should be everywhere, not just in the wealthiest uh, enclaves of our our country. Um, and, you know, this is going to sound like a paradox, but, but we need to approach a post-American phase of history with a spirit of traditional American optimism. Uh, we need to fan out more around the world. I mean, some of this is beginning to happen. I see there's more journalism uh, now, for example, about you know how is the Swiss healthcare system working versus others. I mean, this is a kind of a good thing. We need to do sort of the reverse of what de Tocqueville did so many years ago when he came to America uh, to take back the lessons that he learned to the old world in Europe. Uh, you know, Obama or at least some foundation would be smart to send teams of citizen experts, doctors, engineers, lawyers, uh, whomever around the world to explore some examples and report back to the nation on how they might be adapted. Um, the point is not to imitate other societies, but to take advantage of their experiences um, and the understanding that, that we can profit from that kind of wisdom. When America was the model for the world, we were gracious givers and lenders of our best practices. Now we need to learn how to become gracious and discerning borrowers. So thank you. Thanks for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, nobody expects you to offer any solutions. I'm not even sure you're angry that America is slipping down. But let's say you did mention that the problem is not so much what other people are doing, it's the fact that we're underachieving, underproducing. Why would you think what would happen? I mean, I think that Americans basically, the Americans are people are different from their country more than any other people in the globe, is, is my opinion. Mm -hmm. And the average American lives in its own, you know, self-described vacuum and probably don't know too much about what's going on, and, you know. But, so what happened? What is the what is the dynamic that was suddenly underachieving so much that the rest of the world is passing us by? Right. Well, I don't think it was sudden. I mean, I think, and I think that's important because I well, think I think it was I think there was a gradual kind of erosion that's taken place. I think part of it was that we became number one in in, in, in such a undisputed way, you know, and I mean really after the you know the aftermath of the Second World War and even throughout the Cold War, I think there was a sense that there, you know there was really no challenge to America as a society. So I, I think a certain kind of complacency took root. You know, when you when you're the richest and the strongest and, and, and the best and everyone keeps telling you that you don't know, maybe become as, as hungry as you once were. Uh, the other thing that, that occurs to me is, is a little bit of a, is really very subjective, but a little bit of a Sparta and, and Athens thing that, you know, if, if we overworked our, our sort of hard power or military muscle, you know, did we under, uh, underwork, you know, our more, you know, uh, cultural or civilizational, you know, Athenian, uh, not not muscle, but I guess in this sense it would be you know uh, a, a, a less uh, you know a, a more plastic you know part of ourselves, which which I happen to think is actually more important you know in the long run of things. We be, we became this this the global military hegemon long after we had achieved a certain cultural and economic you know preeminence, and so maybe we've you know we've we've become uh, less original in some sense, but you know it's. You've asked the question that I, I've asked myself many, many times, and I wish, you know, I, I don't, I don't have, certainly don't have the definitive answer to that. Yes, sir. Your comments were very wide and, and, and covered a tremendous amount of area. Mm -hmm. The thing I'd like your reflections on is with the current debasement of the U.S. currency, the, the enormous debt that we're building up, the indebtedness to China mm -hmm. and the U.K., what do you view as the next stage in our economic development? Well, I think you put your finger on, on something that is very important, which is the, which is the status of the dollar. Um, and and um, it's another aspect of... of you know, we, there was a kind of dollar hegemony, you know, the almighty dollar 
that that came after the pound sterling basically lost that role. And part of what concerns me is I don't think people quite realize that you know how much we've gained from that. If if you are the world's number one reserve currency, it means that there's a demand for the dollar and for dollar denominated assets that's that's greater than would otherwise exist. As a result of that demand, uh, prices of those assets are going to be bid up and the yields, you know, the interest rates you're going to have to pay to service that debt are going to be lower. So you're benefiting a great deal. Now, everyone, you know, whether it's the Chinese or the new prime minister of Japan or the Europeans, I mean, the, the petro producers in the Middle East, they're all talking about shifting away from the dollar. Okay, easier said than done. As we learned in this global economic crisis, it was still a flight to safety in terms of dollar assets. But, you know, these things take a long time. So what it means is, is if the dollar becomes less of a hegemonic uh, a currency, it, it will mean that, that it's going to uh, erode to some degree, our, our standard of living, because that kind of premium that we've enjoyed will, will be evaporated. Yes, ma'am. I, I just I didn't get it. You talk about uh, sending uh, professional people like mm -hmm. doctor, engineering to different yeah. countries. Yeah. Is this your suggestion, or is the the Obama and administration yeah. going to do it? Oh. Or is your who? What? Who? who, who? <laughs> This is Paul Starobin, you know, the the the, the in, inconsequential, you know, writer who who's who's you know sending. Yeah, I, I would like to, uh, you know, I, I well, see, I think Obama is a good, is good for this because, uh, you know, I, I view him on two levels. I mean, American, of course, but he's also got this kind of global, you know, vision that that and and it comes, I think, partly from him having lived around the world and you know Indonesia, of, of course. But but so so uh, yeah, I, I would I would. Uh, you know, I, I think it'd be great to put together a kind of best practices, uh, you know, report. I mean, that people can understand. Yeah. Take some picture. We, I think, we watching news only car accident, some murder things. We, yeah. we really cannot see much about what happened in the war. So we don't. Yeah. The Americans are really close. They don't really have lots of information. Yeah. Well, I think you know, there's part of it is also that we're a continental. We, power because, you know, just our geography. And I think this is one d disadvantage, actually, that we have vis-a-vis -vis Great Britain and, and post-imperial Great Britain. I mean, look how, like, London has, has kind of reinvented itself. And, I mean, you know, empires never last forever, but, but you know, great great cities, I mean, you know, can. can. I mean, and so, so I, I, I know if we had, but it's difficult for, I think, for Americans because of our ge geography, we are more in insular in our in our character, I think that I think that can change, but it's just it's just kind of a condition that we have to uh, confront. It's a kind of congenital uh, condition. Although although that's a bit of a paradox, because yes, we have this uh, insular character given the nature of being a continental power, as you said. But yet, so many Americans have come from other parts of the world. Yes. So it's, a it's absolutely very good point. You know, I, I mean, what happens? Maybe they smell that that Rocky Mountain air or, <laughs> or something, and and uh, yeah, and I, I mean, and personally, I mean, my, my you know, just to put all of my cards on the table, you know, my, my wife is a first generation immigrant from from you know central central asia and and uh, I, I wish I, I I'm very pro immigration. I mean, I think that's one of the things that can help refresh us in terms of, you know, because, I mean, yes, and, and you know, we, we've, even though we have a lot of immigration, we're kind of insular, but, but still, I think the immigrants add a lot in terms of our global, you know, our, our cultural vision, you know, speaking all different languages and things. I mean, it can be good just, just as a business, you know, practice. So um, I think that, uh, I think that, yeah, that should continue. Fully, uh, one of the barometers, productivity mm -hmm. in America has always been cited as one of the great economic strengths. We've been the most productive nation in the world mm -hmm. in terms of worker productivity. Is that one still the case, and how would you come? Oh, yeah, I'm glad you asked. Actually, I think I have something on that in here. Wait. <laughs> no, I mean, you t I tried to keep it uh, down to... I'm not sure I success 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, okay, productivity growth from 2000 to 2007 was actually higher in the U.K., Finland, Greece, uh, Ireland, and Sweden. Now, you know, 2007. That's, that's, that's sort of the pre-crisis pre year. So maybe that'll change a little bit. But but I don't I don't think we're. I think it's fair to say we're not the productivity 
you know, p powerhouse, let's say, that we were before. But, but we're no, by no means, you know, at the bottom heap there. But, but other, others are sort of catching up to us. Yeah, I think, I think it's fair. That's fair to say. I'm sorry, was there somebody who had a... I was, uh, I was just uh, going to ask, when I started working as a, I'm a French servant, and when I started working 20 years ago, uh, there was this idea that you had to have some sort of transatlantic uh, understanding on uh, this or that issue to be able to move forward. I have a sense that it's uh, less true now, but I, I'd like to have your ideas on how important is the transatlantic relationship in this new world? Ah, well, I, I think it's a gradual thing, but but my sense is that in in the post Cold War world, that America's attention, at least, is is less towards Europe and more towards other parts of the world, and that that will probably uh, continue. Uh, I'm not quite maybe from a European perspective, it might look somewhat different, but I think there is a kind of re reorientation going on. And, you know, there was a, a time when, when, for example, in the diplomatic community, it was, it was vitally important to send, you know, the most talented people to, you know, to the capitals of, uh, of Europe. Uh, and that, that's not really the case anymore. I, I think, you know, we, we, we look at Beijing or, you know, places like, like that. I mean, Japan is still very important, such a big economy. And of course, G Germany and I mean, the big players are important, but but I think there is a, you know, I, I think India and and Brazil are, are also going to occupy uh, a lot of you know more diplomatic attention in, in the future. So, so I think America, you know, is becoming less uh, Euro uh, focused, really. Good, thank you, Paul. I think about the thank you very much. We have our uh, uh, wine and uh, refreshments out there, and more importantly, a book with uh, Paul's book, uh, which uh, he will be very happy to sign for you. Thank you.